right. Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. As the timer runs down on us, it's uh, 11 o'clock, and so it's time to get started with our praise and worship here this morning. And uh, what a what a great thing, great example just to show. I know half of you have maybe heard me as I was saying, but uh, uh, as Greg steps in and is passing out all the things for uh, communion as we're going to be celebrating here this morning together, apparently I forgot to, to put those things out uh, in preparation for this morning. And in uh, our Bible study Sunday mornings, we were going through the book of Acts. And so we just started chapter 6 this past week. So what a perfect opportunity to, to give us a uh, plug and an advertisement to come and join us uh, to say this was a perfect example of what deacons do at a church. As we've been talking about deacons the last two weeks, uh, so thank you, Greg and uh, Roseanne, for reminding him uh, to remind me that, uh, that I did not do what I was supposed to do and, uh, and for filling in the gaps there. But, uh, you know, as we come together, uh, what, what a beautiful day it is outside the Lord has made. Amen. And uh, we rejoice and are glad in it. And uh, I rejoice and I'm glad uh, for so many different things, right, as I think you are too. And uh, as I think about the church, uh, you know, I think about how the Lord gave himself. You know, he purchased the, the church with his blood. Uh, he is building the church on the foundation. Uh, he is the cornerstone of that foundation, uh, the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, so in that, you know, he continues to do a good work and in his church globally, but also in the local church. And so as we begin this morning uh, with announcements, as we usually do, I'm excited about this first one uh, to share with you. There has been, in case you noticed, uh, I pray that you have noticed, we've had several families, a few new families that have been uh, in the midst of us and joining us the last couple months, kind of regularly attending our worship services. Some of them have been plugged in and uh, coming to our fellowship lunches. Some of them come to Bible studies. And, uh, and I do say that in jest, kind of jokingly, because I pray that you have noticed that and that you have you know, met these people and, and get to know them and introduce yourself and make them feel welcome. And so uh, this morning, I'm going to kind of spotlight uh, I told him I wouldn't embarrass him too much, but uh, if, if you don't mind, Washams, if you just stand for a brief moment, uh, I won't parade you up here and, and embarrass you all properly like. I know Jovi wouldn't like that either, uh, but uh, this is Michael Washam and his wife Becky and their daughter Jovi, and they've been coming for a few months now, and uh, they have been inquiring about church membership, and so uh, Pastor Brian and Steve and I have had the pleasure of meeting with them a few times and kind of walking through what that process looks like, and uh, we are just super excited uh, to share that they have chosen and have uh, chosen to come into covenant membership with First Baptist Island Rada. So we welcome you guys uh, to the family uh, officially. And so, uh, you know, we've talked about what membership is and what membership isn't. And so in that, it's always an opportunity for me to say, if you are considering membership, if you want, if you have questions about membership and what it is or what it isn't or how we view it here, uh, I would encourage you to come and talk to Brian or Steve or myself and we can help direct you in that. But uh, Washams, thank you so much for uh, just being who you are. And I look forward forward to uh, you plugging in and serving in the body here as, as to, does the rest of the body. And look, a body uh, only works when it has all its members, right, and works effectively. And so uh, the parts of the body uh, are significant and are important. So we thank you. We honor you here this morning and, uh, and to all our members because, again, it's not about honoring the Washings. It's not about anything that they've done. It's not anything about what I do or what you do in this body. It's about what Christ has done to bring us into this body uh, and to be united in that. And so we give him thanks for the work that he is doing. So uh, we're grateful that you guys are here and uh, grateful for each and one of you being here this morning. Okay, and by way of announcement, the rest of our week looks pretty, uh, pretty familiar, pretty similar to last week, if you will, that we have Bible study going on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We have community service going on uh, Mondays. You can get plugged in and serving there Tuesdays. And, uh, you know, Pastor Steve's been sharing that we've got over 120, 125 families, you know, every week right now that are getting served. So a uh, great way to come and serve the community, but also to proclaim the gospel. Uh, to people. And so it's been a, a great thing, uh, a great work to be a part of, and we invite you to come and do that. Uh, we also have community um, communion, I should say, and fellowship lunch today after service. So please uh, feel free to join us upstairs right after service. But go ahead and stand to your feet, if you would, and let's go ahead and start our worship this morning of our Lord and Savior. And our call to worship this morning <clears throat> comes from Psalm 34, first three verses. A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together.
Amen. Praise him indeed. And thank you for singing out and singing loud. We are called to make a joyful noise. And uh, I am filled with joy, as you can hear, with allergies and cold symptoms and all those things. I was like, you know, it says make a joyful noise, not a perfectly uh, sound and in tune noise all the time. So, uh, you know, bear with me and let's sing this thing together and continue to worship our Lord. Rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God reign forever. Our hope, our strong Amen. Yeah, praise him. You may be seated. <coughs> oh, sorry. We, we got everything got rearranged around here a little bit. So Merry Christmas. You're doing great work up there, Pastor Craig. We know we're in trouble if they see me standing where you're standing. Uh, Speaking of that, uh, thanks for uh, bearing the, the preaching load for so many weeks in a row. I'm, I'm looking forward to two weeks when I'll finally get the, uh, the privilege to, to bring the full sermon. But until then, you'll just have to settle for my many sermons. Uh, Titus chapter 3 is the scripture reading today. 
remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. What does that look like? Verse 2, to slander no one, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. I mean, if you just let that sit in, you're like, I don't need any more sermon for today. How in the world am I going to apply all those truths right there 100% uh, today or tomorrow? Well, this, this helps when we remember verse 3. When you, when you think about those people that you're tempted to slander or be contentious with or be rough instead of gentle and not consider them uh, because, you know, quite frankly, they don't act in a way that deserves that kind of treatment, right? And so uh, Paul reminds us through Titus in verse 3, we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And that's the people who we live with. That's the people we work with. That's the people on the soccer field sidelines that are mad at the ref or the coach because their kid didn't get to play the whole game. And that's why they act like they act because they're enslaved to sin and they haven't been freed like you have been freed by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to remember that that was me. I see this person and they're acting ugly and I don't want to be nice to them, but that was me and God was nice to me in Christ. And he's called me to be nice to them as I shine his light. He shines his light through us to them in hopes that God will save them. God will change them. And the next thing you know, they're on the sidelines of the soccer game with you trying to reach others for Jesus. Verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but because we were on the sideline yelling at the ref. But in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, he would be made heir, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of eternal life. Paul says we have this treasure in jars of clay, the treasure being the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves, that we're going to spend eternity with Christ in heaven. And so we're here today on the Lord's Day to worship Him. Uh, as a result of what He has done for us, that produces thanksgiving in our hearts, that produces a commitment to follow the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't forsake the assembling together of the believers. And so you're here this morning to assemble with your brothers and sisters, to worship the risen Christ who has redeemed and rescued you for eternity. Well, one of those ways that we worship is through giving. And so let's pray for the offering this morning. Father, we're so thankful for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we remember that the scriptures say every good and perfect gift comes from you, starting with our salvation, going to your provision of our daily bread. And uh, you have uh, established a system with governments and, and monetary exchanges such that we use money and and um, money is a tool uh, that you use uh, in the case of the local church to propagate the gospel through the preaching of the word, uh, through, the, through the funding of the electricity so that uh, your house can be open on the Lord's Day and we can invite people to come and hear the good news that Jesus saves. And so as you lay on each person's heart here this morning to give whatever it is that you want them to give for whatever it is that you have given them already, we pray your blessings uh, as they bring the uh, the first fruits of your goodness to them and that you would use those first fruits to produce even more fruit to bring more people under the sound preaching of God's word that Jesus saves in his name we pray amen there's a plate in the front or the back if you would like to worship through giving this morning
your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, amen. The end is written in Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings. yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Alleluia, praise the one who set me free. Alleluia, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. My living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the Indeed. Praise him. You may be seated. Amen. Yes, if you are uh, under the age of six and you would like to go across the parking lot to Building 2 with Miss Heather, she has agreed to love on you this morning in light of you enduring Pastor Craig's long sermons. Uh, I'm so excited about the Washams uh, joining our fellowship. And Pastor Craig mentioned uh, them covenanting together with us. And so... Uh, many of you have officially joined the church as members and you have signed the covenant. For those of you who have not, I want to take a moment to read the church membership covenant. And if you have questions or concerns about uh, church membership and you don't want to stay all afternoon and talk to me about it, you can go to our website where Deacon Greg has uh, archived all of our sermons and uh, I don't know, it's probably been two or three years ago, but I preached a message on uh, why church membership is a good thing. Go back and review that. Tell me what you think. But uh, this is a good reminder of, of what we who have committed to the fellowship have signed up to do 
for one another. And I think it's an encouragement to you that your brothers and sisters have signed this. And it's a reminder to me of my obligations uh, that, that we have for one another. This is a statement, a covenant, an agreement uh, that is agreed to by those who are uh, members of this church. Having, as we trust, been brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to give up ourselves to him, having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do now, relying on his gracious aid, solemnly and joyfully enter into this covenant with one another. In turn, the elders and leaders of First Baptist Church of Isla Morada Covenant to provide sound biblical preaching and teaching, faithful financial stewardship of the resources entrusted, unprecedented transparency in decision-making processes, and a commitment to pray for and invest in the discipleship and spiritual health of each member. As a member at First Baptist Church of Isla Morada, we commit ourselves to magnify the cross of Christ in all that we do, knowing that it is by the divine grace of God alone we experienced forgiveness for our sins. We will live our lives according to the entirety of God's word, embracing the doctrinal statements found outlined in the philosophy of ministry as a reliable summary of biblical teaching. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor neglect to pray for our, ourselves and others. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavor with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We will work together for the continuance of a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. Furthermore, we will seek by divine aid to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, and remembering that as we have been buried by baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave, so there is on us a special obligation now to lead a new and holy life. We also commit to maintain family and secret devotions, to educate our children in the Christian faith, recognizing that sacredness of the biblical model of marriage and the sanctity of human life. Finally, we acknowledge that we have received and read the philosophy of ministry, bylaws, membership covenant of First Baptist Church of Isla Morada, and we hereby covenant and agree to support and submit to them. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. What a great uh, document I think that is, as you hear echoing in the background various scriptures that we just tried to draw from and say, as believers, wanting to live by the scriptures and faithfully follow Christ and love one another, we're just putting our name to paper to say, yes, we affirm that, and yes, we agree for that. Just like you made a contract uh, when you bought a house or you leased a place to live, you signed and you said, yep, I'm going to abide by this given set of rules. So uh, very biblical, very Christian to do that, and very encouraging to know that you can call on one another as we've committed to love one another. And if you haven't officially taken that step, I want to encourage you to please seriously consider doing that. Well, it mentioned in there that the uh, ordinances of baptism and the other ordinance that we observe as a church is the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to prepare um, my cup by pulling the uh, clear plastic to expose the wafer representing the bread and the body of Christ and then the silver wrapper away from my shirt so as not to stain it uh, when I pop the grape juice uh, below that so that that's ready. And so uh, we have what is called an open communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of this church to participate in this ordinance with us. We just do ask that you be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so parents use wisdom as you think about the age appropriateness of this ordinance for your children. Uh, in most likelihood, if they have not uh, professed Christ and been baptized, then it's probably not time yet in their lives to participate in the Lord's Supper. Um, Paul gives us instructions in 1 Corinthians 11, and there are two uh, aspects that I like to highlight uh, on the Lord's Supper. The first is reflection, and the second is rejoicing. And so Jesus gave us this to remember what he did. So it's a reflection 
that he took our sin upon him. And in that reflection, we examine our own hearts and minds silently, even now, asking the Lord, is there any unconfessed sin in my life? And if the Spirit of God brings anything to our minds, then we confess it silently in our hearts here, knowing that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then on the back side of that reflection, we rejoice in the work that Christ has done on our behalf. So uh, before I read 1 Corinthians 11, I would just like to uh, invite you to meditate for a moment on those truths, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. As we participate in the Lord's Supper together, it is a physical demonstration of the gospel. As we are reminded in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he, Jesus, also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, what a great gift. You have given us through the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary where his body was broken for our sin. And we give thanks that that sacrifice was sufficient to atone for, to make payment for, to ensure justice was served for you as a holy and righteous God. We rejoice that the precious, pure, sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is our assurance of salvation, that we have been washed white as snow, that when you see us, you see the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So us participating this morning in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is an encouragement to our hearts that you have saved us, you have redeemed us through the perfect Lamb of God. And so we are excited to be part of your family through what you have done on our behalf. And now we're excited to continue to worship as we hear your word preached by the man that you've called to do it this morning. We pray for Pastor Craig that you would fill him by your spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, that you would continue to change us, to make us more like Jesus so that you would be glorified in each of us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Please go ahead and take your Bibles out and open up to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Probably a shocker to some of you, right? You're probably already opened up to to Romans and ready to go. Uh, But as we start this morning, uh, I want to start with a question as I often do. But how many many here I think of as Brian talked about the coach or the parent on the sideline you know, think about sports and, and uh, coaching uh, my family, and I know a lot of you have kids that are still playing sports. And how many of you, you know, were active and played uh, sports when you were growing up? Probably a pretty good amount of us, right? And uh, you remember that feeling uh, of excitement uh, and nervous energy you would get like before the 
big game. And if you didn't play sports, maybe it was, you know, other things. Perhaps it was a recital of some kind if you were in gymnastics or dance or piano or something. Uh, whatever it might have been that your interest was in, uh, when you had a big event coming up, remember where you were a little nervous, right, but super excited about the event that was coming up and was approaching. And it just, as the day got closer and closer, the excitement builds, right, more and more and more and more. And, uh, and I'm just trying to give you a, a, a depiction of uh, that's how I feel uh, about Christmas. That's how I feel about Christmas time. I absolutely love this time of year. I love the weather uh, and the change. And yes, for some of you who are up north, it, it is actually changing a little bit now. It actually is cooling down a little bit. This is our weather change, okay? So get used to it. Uh, but I love it. It's very nice. I really love the time that we get to spend with friends and family. Uh, and, uh, and all of that, you know, I love remembering why it is that we celebrate Christmas, right? You think about uh, the cars that have the, uh, you know, keep Christ in Christmas, or he is the reason for the season and all those types of things. Uh, just remembering uh, who it is that we are celebrating. Remember why it is that we're celebrating. And, and I certainly love uh, gathering together with you guys, with my church, my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, to celebrate and worship him. And I always love that and I always enjoy that. But there just is, seems to be something special about this time of year, uh, even in that. I love our um, Christmas Eve service. Uh, if you saw, that was the announcement was on the uh, slides there this morning. And so we will have our Christmas Eve service this year and, and love coming together with our church family. You know, the night before we celebrate Christmas morning with independently with our families and our our friends, and uh, we gather as a church family to do that, and I absolutely love singing together and worshiping together as we look forward to, uh, you know, Christmas morning. And, uh, you know, I say all of that to say uh, that we're going to push the pause button here uh, for a little bit on our study in Romans. We are going to uh, take a brief hiatus or brief break and go through and celebrate Advent, okay? And so we're going to have a small Advent series here uh, over the next month. And so perhaps a good place to start is uh, what is Advent? Uh, why do we celebrate Advent? Should we celebrate Advent? Um, some of you might be thinking, you know, isn't Advent something that the Catholics do? Uh, I thought that that was something, you know, that the Catholic Church does. And so um, I know some of you grew up in that as, as I did. And so so um, I wanted to start by saying Advent is uh, the time of, of year that we celebrate that is the season leading up to Christmas. So Advent is, uh, lasts for a month, and primarily we generally um, celebrate it in the four weeks before Christmas. So it's typically for four weeks. Uh, Roman Catholics do celebrate Advent, as do many Protestant denominations. And so uh, I understand fully that there are many um, rituals and religious practices and, and baggage that can be tied with Advent and those types of things, uh, but that, that is not our goal, right? That is not our intent here. Uh, we want to just simply celebrate uh, Advent season and what that means. And so the word Advent uh, comes from the Latin, and it means arrival, okay? It simply means arrival. It means uh, the coming of or the appearing of. And so it's literally just referring to the arrival of Christ, the coming of Christ or the appearing of Christ. And so in the Bible, we find uh, that there are two arrivals or two advents of Christ. Uh, one, we celebrate at Christmas because it was his first advent where he uh, became incarnate. He took on flesh and, and the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 says. Uh, he was born of a virgin and a manger and all the things that we celebrate and that we pass on and teach our kids and uh, songs that we sing about that, that was Jesus' first advent in his first coming. The Bible then also talks about uh, his, his return or a second advent or a second appearing, uh, which is still yet future, and that is the coming where he will come and he will judge once and for all sin, and he will set up a kingdom that will last forever. Uh, and this eternal kingdom will be one that uh, those of us who are in Christ by faith, we will rule and reign with him for all of eternity. And so, uh, amen indeed, and glory be to God. So over the next four weeks, uh, we're going to try to, the attempt is to prepare, prepare our hearts, right, for Christmas. Um, I think of the song that says, prepare him room, right? Let every heart prepare him room. Uh, and just that we would be intentional about remembering and celebrating Jesus' first advent 
And then also recognizing and looking forward to in anticipation His second advent because we live in a time where we're between the two, right? So we look back upon His first and we look forward to His second. And we're going to do all of this uh, through a series of sermons, uh, four sermons in fact, that will help us focus on some of the key components of the faith. And those are going to be hope, uh, peace, joy, and love. So we're going to have sermons that are going to be focused around those things. And so my prayer is... Uh, that God would uh, just use our time together in His Word for our sanctification and for His glorification, because that's, uh, that's why we gather together, right? Is to worship Him, that He would uh, be glorified, and that we'd be sanctified in the truth of His Word. And so we begin our Advent series this morning uh, with speaking about hope, okay? As you can see the title slide on the screen there. So think about hope. What is hope? Uh, what do you tend to think about when you think of hope? What comes to your mind when you think about hope? Uh, I think oftentimes the word hope, when we use it today, it comes with uh, actually a negative connotation. Uh, connotation. Uh, it has associated with hope uh, doubt, right? I would say those two words that are actually associated together somehow. It doesn't seem like they go hand in hand, but they seem to in our vernacular or way that, that we use it. For instance, you might say something like, um, I hope the weather is good tomorrow, right? Or, or sky, I hope that it doesn't rain tomorrow because I've got a double booked, right? Uh, people say that a lot. And maybe you've talked to people and have you ever asked somebody, uh, you know, when you die, do you know that you're going to heaven? I've often heard the answer, I hope so. And so there is this uncertainty, right? This sense of doubt around the word hope in, in that way. But this is not the way the scriptures use the word hope. In fact, the words that we see in the Bible uh, that are translated usually for hope <clears throat> leave no room for doubt at all. Uh, rather, this word or these words that, that are translated for hope convey a sense of confidence, a sense of assurance in something that is expected. Uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1 gives us the definition of faith, and it says, uh, faith is the assurance of of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it is the assurance uh, of an expectation, right? The assurance or the certainty that this thing that you're expecting will in fact happen. And so uh, the, the Bible talks about hope in a much different way than most people around us talk about hope. And so when we say uh, our hope is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, we don't mean, you know, that, oh, I hope one day that I'm going to make it into heaven. No, it means our hope, our security, our assurance is confidently settled in Christ Jesus by the faith that we have in Him. So... Our text this morning, our main text this morning, uh, we're going to go to many places, but it's, it's going to be from Isaiah chapter 40. So let's go ahead and, and read. If you've got your Bibles open there, I'm going to read from verses 28 to 31, if you'll uh, just follow along with me. The word of the Lord here in Isaiah chapter 40 says, Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Father, we give you thanks in all things because you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You are the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things. And Lord Jesus, we give you thanks uh, that you have chosen uh, to love us with such a great love, uh, Lord, that you would lay down yourself and, and sacrifice yourself for us. What an amazing love you've shown. Uh, that is where our hope is, Lord, for those of us who are in Christ. And so I pray today that, uh, Lord, if any would hear this message of hope, uh, Lord, that you would grant to them understanding of the gospel, that you would change uh, their eternal outcome and uh, change their heart now, that they would come to know you and to be known by you, to live you for you and to love you and to serve you. And Lord, for your church this morning, I pray that your word would uh, encourage us, that I would be able to uh, exhort through your words uh, those in this audience, including myself, 
uh, Lord, just to, to remember and be mindful of the hope that we have that is within us. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name today. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is Living Hope. And the first thing I'd like to draw our attention to uh, is the promise of hope, okay? The promise of hope. So Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength or they shall gain new strength. And the word translated here in this version as the word wait means to wait, look for, hope, or expect. So we could literally say that the translation here means uh, those who hope in the Lord will gain new strength. Uh, And this was written by the prophet Isaiah who lived some 700 years before Jesus was born in the manger. Okay, so we're talking 700 years before the incarnation of Jesus. And he's writing in here. And Isaiah um, is a particular message. In fact, there's two particular messages in the book of Isaiah that God sends through his prophet here. Uh, The first is a message of judgment. So similar to our study in Romans, where Paul begins with the bad news and then he comes to the good news. There's a lot of that in Isaiah and a lot of that throughout the scriptures. But the first message that Isaiah has is a message of judgment. And why? Because if you're familiar with your Old Testament narrative, the nation of Israel was continuing to stray from God. They were continuing to be rebellious against the God who had drawn them out of Egypt, right, and had given them so many blessings upon blessings, and yet they continued to deny him and to reject him and to rebel against him. And so God said, look, I am sending judgment upon you for your sins. And God did so uh, in the form of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, which we've been talking about a lot on Wednesday nights in our Bible study there as we've been going through the book of Daniel. So I would invite you to join us in that as well. But the second message that we find in the book of Isaiah is a message of hope, okay? It's a message of hope. He writes that in spite of Israel's rebellion, in spite of the rebellion of God's people, God will one day fulfill His covenant promises to His people because God's Word is true. Now, this promise did not originate here with Isaiah. Uh, Turn back with me, please, to Genesis chapter 3. Let's go all the way back to the beginning where we see mention of this promise of hope. Genesis 3, and let's look at verses 14 and 15. And in the context, I'm sure you will recall that Genesis chapter 3 is about the fall of man, and this is where Adam and Eve fell into sin, and we've been talking about that in Romans chapter 5 in particular recently. Romans, excuse me, Genesis 3, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, remember the serpent is the one who deceived Eve into eating of the fruit, and then she then passed the fruit to her husband, and so now we have consequences of sin. The Lord God said to to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. What we see here. Um, in Genesis chapter 3 is this first mention of this gospel, okay? That's what we call the uh, proto-evangelium. That just means first gospel or the first mention of the gospel. And we also see something in Genesis which is known as the uh, Edemic Covenant. Well, it's uh, fitting, isn't it? And, and we didn't plan any of these things. We didn't, we're not that smart, right, Brian, uh, to talk about the covenant and the things that we talked about, the covenant of membership and those things. And today in my studies, I was just going through the several covenants that we see throughout the Scriptures in the Old Testament. As we celebrate the Lord's uh, Supper today, we recognize the new covenant that is found in the body and the blood of Christ that He shed on the cross for us that will bring salvation too many. And so the first covenant we see is the Edemic covenant or the covenant, or that means the promise that he made with Adam. God made this promise with Adam and also with all of mankind. And it was a covenant which included curses or consequences to his sin, 
to the actions of Adam, which we know was passed down unto all of mankind, as well as God's provision for that sin. That was also a part of the covenant. Here's the bad news, but God says there is good news and there is hope in me and what I am bringing to the table. And in that, uh, we again see the first mention of the hope and of that gospel because uh, we see that it says there, uh, he talks about how the, the seed of the serpent will be always at enmity with the seed of the woman. So the seed of the serpent is the evil one. The seed of the woman is all of mankind, but in particular, those who will come to Christ. And so he speaks of one of the seed that will come through the woman, which will be one who will crush the head of the serpent. And that is speaking to the gospel. This is talking about the fact that we have all sinned, and Romans 3.23 makes that clear, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 5 makes clear that Adam's sin, remember, as he was the representative of mankind, all of his sin was imputed to us. So all of us are born in sin and all of us live in sin. And in fact, when we get into Romans chapter 6, we'll see all of us are in fact enslaved to sin. And that's the bad news, right? But Paul then switches to the good news. So does Genesis and so does the Bible to say the good news is that God has made a way to rectify what we have ruined, right? To fix what we have wrecked. And so in that, in our sinful nature, we have no hope and we are without God and outside of Him and we are deserving of His wrath and punishment for our sin. The good news is that He chose to love us so much that He sent His one and only Son and who left heaven, came down to earth in the incarnation in the first advent that we're talking about, and He put on flesh and blood. And we spoke about last week why He did that, so that He could then become the federal headship, remember, the representative of mankind, because He had to do what Adam failed to do. He had to do what none of us can do which is live a perfect, godly life, perfectly obedient and faithful to the perfect standard that God gives, which is what He requires. So if the bar is way up here and none of us can reach it, we are all hopeless. But that's why our hope is in Christ, because Christ is the one who fulfills all these things. And through His fulfillment to God's perfection, He is then able to impute His righteousness to those who will believe in Him. And that's, the remember, that double imputation that happened at the cross, that when He died on the cross, He paid for all the sins of everyone who will ever believe in Him by faith. That's the message of the good news of the gospel. And it doesn't end there. Remember, He died, and three days later, He rose from the grave, the Scripture says. And according to the Scriptures, He did that to show that He is who He said He is, and He did what He said He did, and He accomplished that on the cross, saying, uh, as we sang today, the work is finished. It is finished, God. I have purchased Your people. I have washed them free of their sins. And now, our hope is in Christ, the one who has given himself for us. And this is the gospel. And I say to you, if you hear these words in my voice today, do not harden your hearts, but soften your heart and repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will have a living and eternal hope, which will bring you joy and peace and love and all these things that we're going to be speaking about the next couple of weeks. And not just during Advent, right? We speak about those things each and every week. Uh, We should remind ourselves of these things all the time, but it's good practice certainly for us to do. Our scripture reading this morning was from Titus chapter 3, and uh, it spoke to this gospel, this good news, saying, God has not saved us, remember, on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness. That's not why He saved us. Why? Because all of our deeds, Isaiah, in fact, says, are as filthy racks, okay? They are not righteous deeds. He saved us, it says, but according to His mercy. So it is through Jesus Christ that we are saved. And that we are justified, it says, by His grace, being made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And again, that is not, oh, I hope that I have eternal life. That is that I have eternal life because of this eternal living hope that I have in Christ. So the first mention of this promise of hope 
is here in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Um, and that's some over 5,000 years. That's a, about 5,300 years or so before Isaiah would come to write what he wrote. So we're talking about a large span of history, okay? And we know that God actually planned this promise of hope long before the Garden. And you say, how do you know that? Well, because when you go to Ephesians chapter 1, Paul tells us there very clearly, as Paul's writing about justification, which we've been speaking about in Romans, and speaks to our salvation, he says that God predestined us to adoption as children through Jesus Christ, and that He chose us for this before the foundation of the world. So, so many P's that flood to my mind in this alliteration, Brian, just right on the fly, I guess, this promise of hope. But there's been this plan of hope that God has had before He even spoke anything into existence. And so, and that is His purpose, right? There's another P, that His purpose is to glorify Himself in this plan that He has planned since before the foundation of the world to this promise of hope that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it runs all throughout the Bible. Um, Many scholars, many people refer to it as the scarlet thread of the Bible, if you've ever heard that, uh, which is a play kind of on on the story of Rahab and Jericho and the the scarlet thread she put outside the window and how God saved her and her household while he destroyed everyone else around. And so the scarlet thread that runs throughout the scripture is the blood of Christ. It is this promise of hope, this salvation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, You know, it's the focus of the narrative of the Scriptures. Remember, this Bible uh, is, is given to us, and though there's many stories and many people's lives that are, you know, interweaved all throughout it, it's really just one story with one plan, one purpose about one main character who has done one thing, which is bring glory to himself through all of these things that we read in there. So, uh, you know, it's all throughout there. We see it here in Genesis. Uh, we see it all the way to, to Revelation about this message, this plan, this promise. If you skip ahead, in fact, in Genesis, you get to chapter 12, where we have the call of Abraham. And so think about Abraham, and, and there we have the Abrahamic covenant, right? There's another covenant that we see where God makes promises to Abraham stating that he will bless him. Remember, he comes to Abraham and says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make a nation out of you. Kings will come from you. And all the nations and all the families of the world will be blessed through you. (laughs) What an awesome covenant, right? What an awesome promise that is. And remember our study of Romans chapter 4. How Paul alluded to Abraham, right, as an illustration in there of our justification. And it says there in chapter 4 of Romans that he, Abraham, in hope against hope, remember that? Believed by faith, and it says he did not become weak in his faith, but in respect to the promise of God, he did not waver, but grew stronger in his faith. So remember, the hope against the hope was that Abraham is, you know, he, I'm 100 years old. My wife's 90 years old. There's no way this is going to happen. And that's the hope against the hope because that was a hopeless situation. Yet he hoped and knew because God said it was true that his faith, Hebrews tells us, was in God, knowing that he who promised is faithful. Amen indeed. He believed and hoped in God. And we continue to see that narrative. You skip, skip ahead a little bit. We have Abraham, then through his promise, some Isaac. Uh, you know, we have um, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob who is Israel. And then as you continue to progress through the Scriptures, Israel has 12 sons, and those become the 12 tribes of Israel. And we know that through one of those sons, named Judah, would come the line of the kings. Uh, there are judges that, that God uses throughout Israel, and then for a time of 400, 450 years or so. And then the people say, hey, we want a king, and we want to have a king rule over us. And so God brings in this new time in which kings rule over Israel, and there's the split in the kingdom and all those things that we see happening through the Old Testament narrative. But the kings of Judah, the kings of the Jews, will come through the line of Judah, this one son of Israel. 
So skip ahead, skip ahead a little bit more, and we come to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I bring that up because there's another covenant there. That's the Davidic covenant or the covenant and the promises that God makes to David. And I bring those up because I believe they're significant as I'm trying to tie all these things together to this promise. This is is nothing new. We see it through David, that God made a promise to David that, remember how David, it was on his heart, he said, God, I want to build a house for your name. I have this amazing palace. I have all these things and you abide or dwell in a tent, right? And, and this ark that we continue to, to carry around. And God says to him, you're not going to be the one who's going to build me a place. You're a man of war. It will be your son, Solomon. And he makes a promise to David, and he says, through your son, Solomon, it says, he, God, will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, that the house of David and the throne of David would endure before God forever for all of eternity. So in the scriptures, we have the promise of one who will come through Eve to crush the head of the serpent. We have the promise of one who will come through Abraham who will bless all the nations of the earth. We have the promise of one who will come through David who will set up and establish a kingdom that will last forever. These are all parts of the promise of hope that we're talking about. Uh, Turn with me, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 1. You knew that's where we were going, didn't you? Matthew chapter 1. And certainly there's so much more that we could do to to trace the line of of Christ in in this promise, in this plan of hope. Looking in Matthew chapter 1, Verse 1, it says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So those are the ones we just spoke to. Look down at verse 18 and the couple verses following. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Amen. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. Verse 1 tells us here that Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham. And again, you can read through the rest of Matthew chapter 1 to trace that lineage and see Judah in there and see Perez in there and see Rahab in there and just all the sinners that are in that line that God choose to bless bringing Jesus. And through that would bless all of us. And so in that, we see this lineage of the son of David, the son of Abraham, who is ultimately the son of God. And then in verse 18 to 21, we see that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and that he has come to save his people from their sins. Turn over with me since we're in Matthew already. Let's turn to Luke. Turn over to Luke chapter 1. And we'll get a little bit more information about the birth of Christ here. Luke chapter 1, looking at verse 26 to 33, here's another account of Jesus' birth. Verse 26, it says, now in the sixth month, and and right before here is where we, uh, Luke 1 is about Zacharias and Elizabeth and how the the angel of the Lord comes to them and says, you are going to have a child, and that's going to be the forerunner to the Messiah. This is going to be John the Baptist that we're talking about, who was born about six months uh, before Jesus, who was Jesus' cousin. And so verse 26 we come to now says, now in the sixth month, so the sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming uh, in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. 
But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And I just stopped there to say, wow, oh, favored one, that you have found favor with God. Uh, in our studies in Daniel, you see the same thing, Daniel, greatly beloved. Uh, what an awesome thing to be called favored and beloved by God, amen? It says, do not be afraid, for you have been found in favor with God. Verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So here we have more information about the birth of Christ, and we learn his name will be Jesus, and that he will be the son of the most high God, and that he will be the son of David, sitting on the throne of David, his father, it says, and setting up an eternal kingdom that will have no end. So again, we can trace this promise from Genesis 3 all the way through the New Testament where we find Jesus is the promised one. Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. He is the one through whom this promise of hope has been fulfilled and comes. Well, next and finally, let's talk about the power of hope as we gather here this morning. The Bible is full of examples of the power of hope. Uh, some that came to my mind, and, and there's so many that even come now, but uh, think about David and Goliath, right? Would you say that that's an account of the power of hope and of the power of God? How a shepherd boy squares off against a Philistine giant. Uh, this is a hopeless situation, right? This is a hopeless fight. Uh, some would say almost 10 foot tall giant against this you know, young shepherd boy that just came off the farm and ran over to check on his brothers and to check on how the war is going. And remember that all of Israel was there, camped out and just waiting as the Philistines are against them. And this giant Philistine comes, and remember, he's just continuing day after day after day just to come and to stand out there and to challenge anyone to come and fight me. Who has the guts to come against me and blaspheming their God the entire time until finally one steps up to say, you will not blaspheme this God. And David is the one who steps up into this situation that seems so hopeless. And could you imagine how all of Israel and Saul and the army and all of Abner and all of them who are there, David's brothers who are serving in the army, watching, you know, look at our little pipsqueak brother walk out. Like, I'm sure they weren't laughing. I mean, imagine the emotions of what was that all about and just feeling like there is no chance. There is no hope in this, in this boy, and what's going to happen. And then imagine how things changed as that stone strikes the giant in the head and he tumbles down and David in Israel is victorious over their adversary that day. Or how about Gideon? Uh, if you've read the book of Judges, you can find this amazing account of Gideon. Um, who was called, he was one of the judges of Israel. He was called to fight against the Midianites and some of the enemies of God. And he had an army of 32,000 strong. And yet God called him to the side and said, eh, we're not exactly going to do that. And God whittled his army of 32,000 down to just 300 men to go and take on an army that Judges chapter 7 says, the Midianite army, the enemy, it says uh, that you can't even count them, okay? In fact, the Word of God says that they were as numerous as locusts and the sands upon the seashore. So 300 are going to go against this army? Again, hopeless situation. But yet we see the power of hope in that, that Gideon stood strong and led his men by the hope that they had and the assurance that they had that God said, we will defeat this enemy. And their hope was in God, and they did have the victory. So it's moments like this, isn't it, that 
you may not stand before this army. You not, may not stand before this giant. But we do stand before these situations and circumstances in our lives. And it's in these circumstances, in these moments, uh, that we can feel hopeless. And I know many of us do feel that way. And especially, actually, at Christmas time, it's a time that many people feel hopeless and are without hope. But we've got to remember as believers that our hope lies in Jesus Christ. Our hope does not lie in our circumstances or in the situation that we may find ourselves in at any given time. We are not able to overcome certain challenges and trials in our life within our own strength. Anybody give an amen to that? It is only by the power of His might that we are able to make it through certain situations and circumstances in our lives. It's not circumstances. It's not people. It's not places. Because hope is essential to the life of a believer. And I know so many of us, as I look across this room and see so many faces, that I know some some of you and the circumstances that you're in. And if your hope is found in anything other than Christ it is not going to go well for us. That is just the truth of the matter. Hope is essential in the life of a believer because we understand, again, that hope is not derived from circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's not derived from the people that we place around ourselves or in anything else other than our faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul speaks to this truth uh, in the New Testament. He writes in Ephesians chapter 2 saying uh, that when we were outside of Christ, We were strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God. But now, in Christ, you who are once far off are brought near by the blood of Christ. And and look, you may be in that situation right now. We live in a world that is full of hopelessness. We're surrounded by people who feel like there is no hope in their life. You may have those people sitting right across from you at the dinner table. This is the reality of the world we live in. And people all around us are seeking to find hope in anything and everything that they can and in all the wrong places because you will not find hope in anything else. They want to uh, try to find their hope in uh, their wealth or in money or in people that, uh, you know, the people they may know and the clout that they may have. And these things are popular for, for the world to do and probably were, were some of the things that we were doing when we were before outside of Christ and maybe even struggle with as we're in Christ. But you will not find hope in money. You will not find hope in wealth. You will not find hope in politics or groups or memberships or anything else that you may try to place your hope in. Hope can only be found in one place because there's only one source of true hope, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, turn with me, please, to First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. And this one will sound familiar as we sang a song about this hope as well this morning. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Almost said Paul out of habit. But Peter writes here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. I ask you right now, is this living hope and this eternal inheritance reserved for you in heaven? I pray that it is. Verse 5, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though... 
now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, the full of glory and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter sums it all up right here. Uh, This is the living hope that we have by faith in Jesus Christ. This eternal inheritance that we have, this living hope that we have is available by faith in Jesus Christ. And later in this letter, uh, chapter 3, Peter is going to write and say uh, that we should always be ready to give a defense or an answer for the hope that is within you. And so all throughout the Bible, we find out about this hope that we have as believers. And so as we focus, you know, in on Christ this Christmas and what He has done for us, let us not forget, in fact, what He has done for us. And that without Him, we have no hope. But with Him, our hope is secure. You can be confident in the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And it is a hope that is living within us. It is a hope that enables us to endure through the trials and the tribulations that we know come our way. And that's why it says we are able to rejoice in those things, which is an amazing thing. But let us also remember, as Peter writes, to always be ready to give an answer to those who ask about this hope that is within you, uh, that that is our duty, that is part of our responsibility. How can we take this hope that we have and share it with others? It, we are not called to this, this promise of hope and given this, this plan of hope and this faith that we have and this great hope and the power of hope that we have <coughs> to bottle it up and store it within us. We're not to uh, take the light and hide it under the bushel, right? But to remove the bushel so that it will light up the entire house. We need to go out with this message of hope and to proclaim it to all those around us so that they too would know the hope of Jesus Christ. We give you thanks this morning, God. We praise you because you are worthy of our praise. In fact, all things have been created by you for that purpose. So, God, we thank you that you have called us to this promise, this plan of hope. Lord, that it is your purpose in doing that, and your purpose is to glorify yourself in that. And you tell us that you will bring glory to yourself through us, and that you have called us to be representatives and ambassadors for you, that we would take this message of hope, that we would proclaim it, Uh, Lord, not just in this Advent season, not just in this Christmas season, but God, uh, in every season of life that we find ourselves through the trials, through tribulations, through the joyful and, and happy times, Lord, through all of it, you are with us. You promise to never leave us nor forsake us, and we thank you for that promise. We thank you for all of the promises we find in your word and for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. God, we pray that you would help us to be a greater light in this time, in this place for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Benediction this morning comes from Romans chapter 15. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Uh, Please stay and join us upstairs for lunch in this next hour. And visitors, uh, we'd love to have you and get to know you a little bit more. So please come and stay.